Good afternoon, everyone. This is episode 85 of Funny Like a Clown Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Worth. November 10th, 2020. As always, Funny Like a Clown Podcast is brought to you by G Vegas Buffalo Sauce. For the spicy, sweet, savory taste of game time, there is only one G Vegas available at www.gvegas.webs.com. Go there, get it shipped right to your door. Now, you don't want to shop in the COVID area. Get it shipped right to your door. You can have some buffalo wings while you watch the game. Um, it is Veterans Day this week. I want to put a shout-out to all the veterans out there, and thank you very much for your service. So uh, who better to have on for a guest than a 35-year veteran of the comedy scene, formerly from Chicago, now residing in Boston, Bill Campbell, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dennis. Nice to be here. Well, thank you very much for being on. Uh, 35 years, they say a lot of water rolls under a bridge in 35 years, so you've been at it a long time, but how'd you get started? I, uh, actually, I think it's almost 40 years. It's a long time. <laughs> I got started back in the late 70s in Boston. There was no comedy clubs back then. Right. Where you would go to, like, gone shows and uh, happy hour with, uh, uh, country singers or uh, no folk singers, you know. Right. They do a couple songs, and you do five minutes, then you get gone. <laughs> <laughs> memories, right? Good memories. Huh? Yeah. Then, then around 1980 or so, the comedy connection started, and they started by, down at the Charles Playhouse, and it was Sean Morey, who now is in L.A. He was a street performer, and he had a following, so he had a Wednesday night at the Charles Playhouse, they had a regular thing on Friday and Saturday night, and uh, so he got Wednesday night, and he was bringing people in, so they liked him, so they gave him Saturday, and so he had a Wednesday, so he gave it to uh, Paul Barkley and Bill Downs, who had taken a comedy class with Sean Morey at the time. Okay. So they decided they were going to do a showcase, like it was in New York, you know, the Improv, and Catch a Right Star, which was the only comedy club, so to speak, on the East Coast. Right. And uh, I started doing it there. And that was the first time I really felt like I could do it. It was actually comedy. I mean, I, I had been doing it with people like Mike Donovan and uh, Teddy Bergeron and a few other guys in these small little bars and gone shows and stuff. But then when the comedy started in 1980, it was the first time we had just a comedy audience. And now, did you just walk in there and, the, like, an open mic thing get signed up, or did you have to know somebody yeah, to get in there? Yeah, open mic. In fact, they were looking for people, because, you know, there was no okay, right. comedy club thing. So, right, right. You know, the first show was, like, me and Bill Donald, who else was on? Oh, Donovan might have been there. Sweeney came pretty soon after. But anyway, we did it for a couple of weeks. We just split the door, and there might have been 15, 20 people. But what were you charging? For, how much was the ticket back then? What? How much? Are probably like ten bucks. Ten bucks back then. Okay. So you weren't getting so, rich, but you, but were, you were getting something. But the third or fourth week, Steve Morse from the Boston Globe came in, and uh -huh. he did a review of the show. I know Donovan was on. I was on. I yeah, getting in the newspaper—that's always good. But he did a review, and it was in the calendar section of the Boston Globe. At that time, you know, there was no internet or anything. Right. And after that one article, the next week. The line was around the corner. And that's what advertisement does for you, sure. <laughs> it was full. The one week of a good article, and the place was packed. And it was the beginning of a rush from... So it stayed that way? It wasn't like a rush then went away? Started. I mean, it became this big rush. The comedy was everywhere all of a sudden. Right. Now, were, were there any comics, like mainstream comics, that you looked up to that you, you said, this is why I want to do comedy, I want to be like these guys? Yeah, I mean, I really was a big fan of George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Robert Klein, Lenny Bruce. Those are my... The legends of the day. <laughs> oh, I, I idolized George Carlin and Richard Pryor. I just thought they were... Yeah. Well, speaking of the legends of the day, I mean, you, you're part of a very special time in Boston comedy. I mean, I'm a, I'm a history buff. I love the history of comedy. If you went to L.A., the comedy store, that's the historical... Comedy, you know, on, on the West Coast where the Richard Pryors and Robin Williams came from. Uh, 
If you went to Houston, you'd have the Comedy Workshop, the Bill Hicks and the Sam Kennison's came from. New York, it was Dangerfields and all his young comedian specials. But you were part of the Ding-Ho Boston comedy era, where she brought all the great comedians of Boston comedy up. Uh, you know, yourself, Lenny Clark, the Steve Sweeney, the Jimmy Tingle, Bobcat Goldway, Paul Poundstone. But what, what do you remember about the Ding-Ho days? The Ding-Ho, those of us who were there during the Ding-Ho have such fond memories. I think Steve Wright used to describe it as the Woodstock of comedy. I mean, it was, everything was new to all of us. And like I said, the crowds, you know, you would go and it'd be packed and people waiting in line and none of us were famous. Right. But you had no competition either. What? You had no competition. If there's only one comedy club, it was either you guys or nothing, right? That's true. But it was the Comedy Connection and the Dana Hall. There was two. Okay. But very fast, it grew into many. But the but the uh, crowds came. I mean, the Dingo used to do, Lenny had his own show on Wednesday night, and they would do shows Wednesday night, Thursday night, two shows Friday, sometimes three shows Friday, two or three shows Saturday, Sweeney had Sunday night. I mean, it was comedy, and there was people, packed crowds <laughs> every mm -hmm. night. So like when you're a new comic, you were like on a Saturday night, there would be four of us be booked, and there would be one guy would be the host. Right. And the host got a little more money because he had a little more time. He had to open the show and introduce everybody. So instead of the host being the lowest paid guy, the host was the highest paid guy. There was no headliner, middle, or opener. Right. Everybody did 20, 25 minutes because we were all new. We were all the showcase type thing, right. And uh, so everybody was equal, and everybody got a similar amount of money except for on the nights when Lenny had his own night, and, and and it was just so, the crowds were so good, Dennis. I mean, yeah. you know how you hit a stage and the crowd just jumps at you? They want comedy, they want it. They're yeah, laughing yeah. at the setups. Right. Yeah, I mean, they were so good. And those of us around back then remember really building confidence from such good crowds. So. Mm. You say the name Stephen Wright. I mean, everybody knows Stephen Wright now, but back then he was a nobody. So I mean, he was doing. Oh yeah, this brand new. Same I as you. Stephen Wright, the comic act, the first night he ever did it. Really. The funny thing is, he would. Uh, I don't know if he smoked a lot of dope or not, but he would always kind of try to memorize his act and never quite get it. He'd, he'd forget lines. Yeah. But his stuff was so funny. He would like do a line, and then he'd pause. And you would think like it was all planned, but it wasn't planned. I don't think. I think Steve was trying to remember. Right, what trying to remember the next was. line. Right. So were you, yeah, were you there from the beginning? So where a pause would kind of throw us off. You know, we want to keep going. Yeah. Want to get him going. Steve would pause, and he was so funny. He'd do the line, and boom, he's right back up. Huh. He was always special. I mean, we always knew Steve was special right from the first time you saw him, because every joke was so funny. He was different, different cells. That's what everybody's looking for, something different, you know? Different and unique. All right. So were you there from the beginning when the Ding Ho first opened? Were you there? Or? Pretty much. Yeah, okay. So do you remember when they got the call from the Tonight Show that they wanted you guys to set up a showcase? What was the mood like then? Oh, yeah, I remember that. So what because was the mood for the Jack, comics? Me and Jack Gallagher, another really good comic who lives out in uh, Sacramento, Sacramento now, I think. Uh... We had a, I had a job that night, and everybody was going to the Ding Ho because there was the Tide Show was coming. But I always had two. I always had kids. You know, I had little kids. Right. So I always wanted every penny I could get. <laughs> <laughs> you got to survive in comedy. <laughs> so me and Jack went to the job. We came back to the to Ding Ho. I mean, I, no one really. I didn't ever thought seriously anybody was going to give a shit about us. We were yeah. always Boston, you know. You had to go to New York or L.A. to really right. be considered a big time. Yeah. They said something from Tonight Show was coming. I, I don't think I really took it seriously. Well, but it was. It was Jim, what's his name? Jim McManus and Jim, I forget his name now. Well, even Steven but, uh, said most of the comics. He had a kid going to college, and he came, and he saw right. And yeah. Well, Steven didn't even stick around show. after the show. He said... He said he didn't even take it serious either. He said he took off and went home. They had to call him and said, hey, you know, they wanted you. He said the other comics yeah, were in the parking lot. Yeah, call him. He thought it was a joke. Yeah. I mean, he said, who is this? <laughs> he said it was so-so for tonight, Jody. He goes, come on, who is this? 
Then he said he tried to, try to call all his friends to tell him and nobody was home. He didn't have nobody to tell him. It's not Joe. That had to be we dangerous. We didn't expect it until that. He was the first one from our group, you know. Yeah. So the move, the move for the comics where you guys weren't really taking it seriously. I mean, after you saw him on The Tonight Show, what was the mood like then at the club? You know, back in those days, the crowds were so good. Everybody was just enjoying the crowds. And gradually... It started to change when people got in, you know. I mean, yeah. Steve Wright got that, and then he kind of moved to L.A., and he got an agent, and he was off to the races. Right. Uh, and then, after that, I think Goldflake got something real soon. He got a Letterman and something else, and, mm -hmm. and I think he got some kind of mo police, he might have got a police academy. Police academy, right. So he was right. So... Gradually, people were getting seen, and it became known that Boston was a place to check it out. But we still didn't have many people coming through looking for talent. Right. So you guys, uh, I mean, you set the tone for, for what it is today. I mean, now there's a comedy club all over the place. There's a lot of great acts back then. There was uh, Steve Wright, and Jack Gallagher, who I said, Lenny and Gavin and Sweeney. And then there was uh, a guy named Joe Lasky who just passed away, who was... Uh, he ended up doing all the voices for the guy who did Bugs Bunny and all that. Right. Uh, he ended up going out to L.A. doing, I think he got a couple of awards. Really? There was a lot of great acts. You know, and like I said, everybody did 20 minutes, and they got, as they got better, some people moved on. Dana Gould, really good young, very young. Some were very young. I mean, Paula Pounce and Dana Gould, they were very young, like 18. <laughs> Now they're the legends, you know, so who knew what back then it would have turned into what it is, right? No, you don't know. You yeah. don't know. But I always claim a good crowd, a good club with a good crowd, you'll get good comics. Right. Sooner or later it'll happen. So what happened then, unfortunately? Right <laughs> unfortunately, the ding ho ended up burning down, so what happened after it burnt down to you guys? You know, the Ding Ho was run by these Chinese guys. I think they gambled away all their profits. Yep. <laughs> and uh, we used to go in on a Saturday night, and they'd be buying Coke from the convenience store across the street and shit. <laughs> right. And then one day, Sweeney went in for a Sunday night show, and it was just locked up. And that was it. So where so, did you guys end up then? The clubs had spread. There was Played Against Sam's, and then Crimmins got Stitches going. And so by that by that time, when the Ding Ho closed, it was... Okay. So you weren't out of work. Spread. There were other places you could go to. Yeah, it was still spreading uh, throughout the 80s, you know. And then people were getting TV shows, you know, Evening at the Improv and uh, 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 Comedy on the Road and A&E. And people were getting things. And some people were moving. Like I just said, Paula moved to San Francisco. Dana moved to L.A. Uh, uh, some of the younger guys, younger people especially, that didn't have family like me, you know, they moved out, right. found their way. But the club was still going good until around, I think around the early 90s or late 80s, early 90s, it started to slip because people are putting mics up everywhere. You'd have a... <laughs> the place would have a mic up in the corner. They do a Tuesday night. I mean, it was so popular for a while. Yeah. Everybody wanted in on it. So naturally, that killed part of it. Yeah, bowling alleys became comedy clubs, right? Everything oh, was yeah. a comedy club. Yeah, right? lots of them. And then also it was on TV. You you could watch even at the Improv. You could watch Comedy on the Road. Right. So I don't know. People would speculate what killed it. It didn't really kill the business totally. It just stopped growing. It hurt it. It definitely hurt the business, yeah. Cause... And the people stopped coming like they were coming. You had a dentist so... who wanted to be a comedian rather than a professional comedian, and there's a big difference, right? Yeah, and then gradually they stopped coming, especially during the week. Yeah. So comics like me that were doing it for a buck, I mean, I went on the road. I worked in Pennsylvania, and I worked. I worked for different guys. So how, was, how was the road for you as compared to being a home-based comic? How was the road compared to what? To being a home-based comic in one spot. Well, you know, the road is harder than doing the thing home. <laughs> yeah. Living out of, of a suitcase, crowds, right? A <laughs> lot, lot of different situations. But in those days, comedy was growing across the country. Right. So every market, grad I mean, Boston and San Francisco was the 
first two markets to really catch after LA and and New York. And but gradually it spread across the country. I mean, there was a guy that had a club in Pittsburgh and Milwaukee, and then there was another people had there was a guy that had a club creative started this club across the South. Because Boston and San Francisco had a little bit of reputation, you could get work right. until gradually there were comics from everywhere. So, did I mean, you make did a decent a show living, or was it in the South, where Steve Harvey was like the opener? Yeah. Did you make good money at it, or was it just enough money to get you to the next town or the next club? Well, I don't know if you call it good money. Some people might have made more than me. I mean, I made, you know, I made it. I made enough for a regular job. Right. Comedy's you know, better than working for a living, right? <laughs> I was excited to be a comic, you know? Sure, sure. It was sure. exciting to be a comic. But then, gradually, not only get more comics, it got more competition, and uh, yeah. it got harder and harder as the time went on. So what's the biggest change you see in comedy today as compared to when you first started out back then? What's the biggest change you see? Well, I, I think there has been a, there's always been a tendency to uh, take advantage of young comics or comics coming up, right. you know, you can do this for stage time or, you know, you don't know, this is going to help your career as people make money off you. That's always happened. But That's the way comedy on, is, though. Yeah. to be more and more of that. You know, you got the bringer shows, you got to bring the audience. You gotta pay your dues, though, too. You know, nobody starts out headlining the first week in comedy. I mean, if you're a young comic. That's no. part of paying your dues. You know. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It takes a while, but it, it's it's kind of a it's turned into like a, a a business, and it's a hard business. You know. Right. Trying to get the people to come. It's a very cutthroat there's, there's business. Different niches, yeah. you know, and some of the niches are. It depends on your act, how whether you fit in the niche. There's the casino and the cruise ship, and then there's the uh, comedy clubs, and there's fundraisers. And hmm. It's all a little bit of a challenge to find out what you do best and where it fits in the best. Well, I always said there's three sides of comedy. There's the being funny, the business side, then there's the political side too. And the being funny usually lasts. The business, and political side, you know. How much money can you make and, you know, who do you know, it kind of comes in first, don't it? Well, they're definitely political. and Some some comics are not only good comics, they're good salespeople. Right. And they're good at selling themselves. And you can kind of tell it right away. They just, it comes naturally to them. Now, sometimes they're ruthless and jerks and sometimes they're not. But some others, like I would put myself in that category, I'm a lot better comic than I am a salesperson. Right. So, you know, networking, and I wasn't really a good networker either. I had family, and they always came first. I would always go home. I mean, I'd go to shows, and they go, oh, Bill, you want to go early, right? And i go, yeah, I could if I could get out of here early. Yeah. I'd appreciate that. Well, it sounds like back then you guys were like a family, and you all supported each other. As compared to nowadays, everybody's stabbing each other in the back and doing whatever it takes to get ahead. There was a period of time where it was like that, Dennis, where they did support each other, but Part of it was we were all on equal levels right. as far as uh, power bases. As that changed, there was backstabbing and the same old thing like, right. Right like now, it is today. Right? Know, we weren't that, uh, our character was not that supremely better than anybody. But it tends to be comics to start together that are the same level, often have some comradeship with each other. Right. And we had that, and especially since we experienced the whole thing kind of start now. Right, right. But uh, I bet there's some comics now there, young comics that are friendly with each other. It yeah. is competitive. It's you find your circle, right? You find your circle of comics nowadays where there was only one circle back then. Now everybody finds their circle, and that's who you work with are your friends, right? That's right. And I, always, I have always had a hard time trying to do shows when... Most of the audience is comics. <laughs> yeah, it's tough, I know. So Because, you know, I mean, if you're a comic, you're laughing at your friends and you're thinking about when you got to go up. Well, every night's different, you know. Some nights you get just comics and other nights it's packed. You never know what you're walking into. Some nights there's 200 people and some nights there's 10. You don't know, you know. 
Yeah, I wish I knew the trick to getting people to come. It's, it's very That's difficult. It? <laughs> it's, it's not an easy trick, but uh, in 35 years, I mean, you personally in your career, what, what would you say is the high point of your career in 35 years? The high point? I don't know, you know, I think the high point of any of this is I had a lot of nights over the years, some in a, in a regular established club like... Uh, Rascals in New Jersey or uh, Catch a Rising Star down in Princeton, New Jersey, or clubs that would have a little bit of cachet. I've had good shows in them like going home feeling really good. And then I've had shows just in a little bar in the middle of uh, New York State somewhere where they're just doing a fundraiser and there's like 100 people and they're just the nicest people right. and the greatest crowd. So when I'm in the car going home, that crowd feels as good as any. You know, mm -hmm. I always say, if you're on your way home from the show and you really feel like it was good, you were good that night. They mm -hmm. liked you. You enjoyed it. You feel good about what you did. And that's as good as this gets. That's the reward, yeah. No matter what the money is. Right. That feeling, doesn't matter where you do it, whether it's in a big casino or in a cruise ship, that feeling... That's what you do it for, even more than the money. Now, you started out with all these guys. You know, you mentioned all the big names there. And you being a family guy, you know, you chose your family first, which I respect you for that. But were, were you envious to see some of these other comics who didn't have a family go on to become national stars? Where, how, were you, I mean, you were happy for them, obviously. But was there any part of you that, hey, that could be me, you know? Any part, any of that? You know, I'll tell you the truth. I, like, I would have liked to have more fame than I have. Right. I, I felt my act was good enough to get more more success than I had. But I work for, I've been working at this for 40 years on a regular basis. And I made some decisions to not go places because of my family and because of my children. And I, my children are grown now and they are terrific to me. And I don't regret any of those decisions. Yeah, that's a great decision. There's no regret there. Yeah, and, family comes first. And sure. I don't know if I was good enough to get more than I got or not, but I do not regret my decision. Right. You know, I always say, I know some people are really successful, very successful. And, I, and when people ask me about it, I say I have two feelings with the ones I know. One feeling is, such a good guy. I couldn't be happier that he's doing so, she's doing so well. I always liked them. I like to act. I like the way they handle themselves. I like the way they treat people. I'm so happy for their success. I don't feel any jealousy at all. Okay. And then there's the other one. That son of a bitch asshole. I never liked that asshole. <laughs> there's plenty of those in the business, yeah. Please don't let me talk about him. I hate the fact that he's more successful than me, and I really don't want to think about it. <laughs> So, I mean, being a part of all those guys at the Ding Ho, I mean, do you still stay in touch with any of, like, the Paula Poundstones or the Bobcat Goldways or the Stephen Wrights, or did they all go their own way? And... For the most part, people go their own way, yeah. at least as far as I'm concerned. Right. I, I am in touch with Tingle every now and then, but Tingle puts together reunion shows. We just did one. I saw it was an internet yeah, show, a wasn't it? a reunion show where and I saw Paula for the first time in quite a while, and I saw... Uh, some other people from L.A. I hadn't seen in a while. Now, was that a live show or was that on the Internet? Uh, Goldthwait put together a memorial thing in New York that I went to, and I saw Tom Kenny, who was uh, SpongeBob, and uh, Louis C.K. was there. And, really? And uh, I enjoy seeing these people. You know, you, I haven't seen them for a long time. Right. And some of them, like Louis C.K., are very more excited successful than I am. But they're always really nice to me, and I usually enjoy seeing them. Like I say, there's a few that I don't have good feelings for. Right. For the most part, some of them are really nice people, and I'm happy for their success. And you're still a working comic, and you do what you love to do, right? Yeah, I would be if it wasn't for this pandemic. I well, mean, I was, how do you think I was that's affected? How was, how? March. Well, what do you think the future of comedy is now with the pandemic? I mean, it's pretty much shut us down. I mean, you've been around 35 years. You've seen it all. What do you think the future of comedy is now? Boy, it's really a tough call on this. Yeah. I mean, I think it will come back. People like, there is nothing like a live show. Right. You know, watching comedy over the TV or 
in a parking lot or yeah, there's nothing like a live audience where you have someone right close to you that's yeah. funny. You laugh from the beginning of the show for an hour and a half. <laughs> there is no show like that that you can watch. You have to be present to enjoy that. And I think there will always be a market for that because it's such a fun thing to do. So I think it will come back, but it's not going to come back right away <laughs> until you can get people in, a, in, in an audience. In a safe, yeah, think, safe way. I don't yeah. think you can put them in parking lots in their cars. And <laughs> huh. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's working good yeah. for people. I haven't done one. So <laughs> you you do don't it. have a crystal ball. It's tough to tell how it's going to turn out. Nobody knows. That's the big unknown, I guess, right? I think when they can finally put 100 people in a room together, Together and have a regular show, then it will come back. That's it. People like it. All right. Well, uh, check it out. Comics can't wait to do it again. Yeah, yeah, I know. You miss, you miss it. It's an addiction, like anything. I mean, making people laugh is an addiction, and you miss that addiction when you can't make people laugh anymore. Yeah. I miss it. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, one of the more interesting things I, I saw about you. Uh, you know, you, you've opened for a lot of legends, you know, in the comedy world, and I saw one, you got to open for Roy Orbison one time, who's a musical legend, and for the kids don't know, he sang Pretty Woman, but tell us that story, what was it like opening for Roy? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> How did that come about? You know, I opened for Roy Orbison at this big kind of nightclub in Lynn at the time, and... Roy Orbison went through a period where he had a terrible tragedy. He had all the success, Pretty Woman and all these songs, Crying and everything. Right. And then he had a terrible accident. I think his a car accident, his wife was killed, and maybe one of his kids or something. And so he, 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 went, out, he went silent for a while. No one heard from him because of these terrible tragedy he went through. Right. And then, he, and then he started a comeback. And when I opened for him, he was just starting this comeback. And, not in big arenas, and in kind of smaller clubs. This was still about 400 people, but mm -hmm. it was smaller for him. His, and the guy that ran it was trying to make as much money off this audience as he can. He must have had a payroll or something, because he had a band play from like 8 to like 10, or 8 to 9.30 or something, for an hour and a half. Now the place is packed, and they're all drinking, waiting for Roy Irvin. Roy Orbison hasn't performed live hardly at all in the last couple of years. So they're all waiting for Roy Orbison. And after having a band play for like an hour and a half, two hours, they took a break, and then they introduced me. Oh, boy. <laughs> from from off stage <laughs> to this big stage. You know, it's a, band, a rock band, a big stage, and a an, uh, balcony and everything. is a, now comedian Bill Crumble. And I hit the stage. And literally 20 to 30 voices from all over the audience that I couldn't see because it's black, I got a spotlight on my face, started yelling, you suck, get off, where's Worms? Oh, geez, tough crowd, tough crowd. They literally yelled at me <laughs> the whole time. So I'm going into my act, I did it like five, six, seven minutes, and I looked down the front row, which is the only one I could see, and I, the guy looked at me and shook his chair, was like, I don't know what you're going to do, pal. I mean, they're just screaming, get off the stage, we want Roy Orbison. Wow. Tough nights in comedy so you have. Huh? less than 10 minutes. Less than 10 minutes. Really? Walked off figuring this guy's going to kill me, but I, I'm not going to stay here and have him screaming at me. I can't even see who they are. Right. It's all dark. So I go backstage. This is a true story. I go into a room with a guy that booked it. Yeah. And he says to me, how'd it go? <laughs> you don't want to know, right? I said, fine. He gave me the money, and I left. Oh, oh. <laughs> so did you even get to meet Roy or no? Never met Roy. Never even met Never Roy. Never saw Roy. Oh, so we don't know what. Huh? Those are the nights you remember in kind. You remember the good nights, and you remember the bad nights. Every night's yeah, different, you, right? you sure remember the bad ones. That's for sure. I'll tell you. You remember the bad ones. Yeah, but, uh... So you know, I, mean, I have a I have a dry bar comedy special that I did. Tell you what this pandemic has done. This dry bar comedy online special. Have you heard of them, Dennis? Yeah, yeah. I see the the comedy uh, studio up in Boston is doing those regular. A lot yeah, of people they get you go to audiences. So I did a dry bar with a woman named uh, Maria DeGorgio from New York and L.A. and this. 
New York guy named Matt Jenkins, black guy, terrific guy. Three of us did this. You got to go to Provo, Utah to, to film it. Yeah. And uh, they had an audience really well set up and everything. And then after a while, they produced it and put it online. And, and then it, and if you sell a certain amount of things, you get some benefits from it. They paid you pretty good. So I did it like last winter, and I, and I was all set for it to come out. Pandemic That's never it. got released. Oh, boy. So they told me they're going to release it in August. Oh. Never got released. I just talked to them a month ago. Oh. They're thinking January. <laughs> online seems to be the thing right now. You know, it's the only thing for comedy. It's different than, you know, throwing jokes online. I just it's released. Yeah, you, you make some money off it, right? Good. Yeah, that's what you did it for, right? But, uh... Let's see, you do uh, you do what you call a one-man show about, they say, you know, the real-life stuff's funnier than anything you could make up, and you talk about your real-life, your dad stuff, you know, being a dad and real life I about being a dad. I have a show that I do called, uh, I call it a parenting story. It's a story about me and raising my children, and it's got serious moments as well as comedy. I liked it. I did it at theaters, and I did it whenever I could get a booking for it. I did it at some parent conferences. Okay. And, uh... It was just selling it was harder than doing it. <laughs> How were the crowd responses to it? It's good. Crowd what? response was good. Because, I mean, me being a father, I could relate. But these young kids, if you're not a parent, then it's tough to relate to what you're talking about, you know? Yeah, it was not a show for a comedy club. It was more of a theater kind of thing. Oh, I see. Okay. It, it, was, it, was, it was funny. But uh, I still have it. People ask me to do, I would do it, but yeah. like so. I said, I never have figured out how to get people to come. But the shows I thought were pretty good. I don't remember bombing with it or anything. Right. Huh. Well, you started out your own local television show also called Bill Campbell's Comedy Corner. Tell us a little bit about that. I have been doing this uh, cable show for cable access here. I live in Chelmsford. Yep. And I've been doing this cable show since 1997. And I do like five a year, and I have a guest or two, and I have a little studio audience. And, and uh, I was selling it all. It was going all around the country to little cable access channels. And I, But then the pandemic hit, so I haven't done one since last year. It's a basic half hour. I have a guest. I do like five minutes, and the guest does ten, and we have an uh, interview before the audience. And it's a mm -hmm. nice little show. I mean, the cable access people love it. Yeah. You get a lot of make a mint off cable access. No, but it's a, it's an advertisement piece. Any anything on uh, yeah on the internet now, you're not making any money off its advertisement. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it did give me shows. Like I would do the show, and I have a little bit of reputation around town as the local guy. As, so people would do fundraisers, and they'd hire me, you know? Yeah. Now, did you have on your friends from the Ding Ho days on the TV show, or? Oh, yeah. Who were some I of the names they were? Tingle did it. Tony V did it. Uh, well, did it? Mike McDonald did it a bunch of times. Uh, Mike Donovan did it. Bob Lazarus passed away. He did it. Uh, Tom Gilmore. I mean... Uh, a lot of people from those days. Oh, uh, Linda, that Linda Smith. No, I had uh, uh, who's the lady that does all the cruise ships? Julie Barr did it. I mean, these are all names from the past. I don't yeah, know. these are Boston names. If you're from Boston, you know all those names, right? Yeah. Uh, pretty much most of the acts that I knew did it. There's some people that will not do cable access because it's beneath them. But right. for the most part, I had most of the acts that I know to. Right. I mean, it's easy to do because it was a small studio audience. You get a tape of the show, no money, but uh, it was easy. To, the crowd was good. The crowd was always yeah. very nice. And well, you, you can't even do comedy albums anymore because you know with the internet, they're sharing them for free. You can't make any money. Well, you know, we grew up on comedy albums. You can't even. You got to put out a comedy special for free and charge twice as much for a ticket. Now is how you make money. It's a different day and age. Yeah, I'm probably behind on the latest thing. Yeah. I mean, I have Facebook. And so before the uh, pandemic, I mean, you're a working comic. I mean, how often, how many shows were you doing a month as compared to the old days? Is it more or less? Oh, I'm doing, I was doing less. Less than the old I mean, days? I, I was doing less than, than the old days. Right. The old days, it worked just about every night. But now 
now the last last five six years I was usually working three weekends out of a month. Well, that's not bad, yeah. No. So I mean, and you then get... I had some good months where those weekends paid pretty good. Yeah, some, some months are better than others. Months yeah. where I only did two weekends, I didn't pay so good. You know, it's always up and down, and you think you're going to be out of the business, and then somebody gives you something, and you're good for a little while, and then that dies, and you're on something else. Right. So, I mean, you got a lot of, you're doing a lot of these shows, and a lot of these young comics are opening for you. Like you said, you got the host, you got the opener, the feature, and then you the headliner, but was there any young kids you've seen that really stuck out to you that you think are going to be the future of comedy? I mean, there's a lot of good young acts. Right. I mean, uh, where are the names in the Boston area? That, I mean, Will Noonan is a name nowadays. Is doing good. Right. He did my show. I mean, I remember when Wendy Liebman was a nobody, you know? Well, I remember what? John Parada said he paid Bill Burr 20 bucks to host a show for him once. Now look where Bill Burr is at now, so you never know, right? I did a show with Dana Gould, who I think I paid him 30 bucks. Right. Now, were you around when Dane Cook was on the scene? You know, I think he was there, but I don't remember him and I crossing paths. If we did, I don't remember too much about him. Okay, yeah, so... We weren't... We weren't... If we if we knew each other, it was really in passing. Yeah, I don't it was have brief, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill Burr is another one. I never really worked with Bill. Right. But just to know these guys came out of the same area as you, Boston, I mean, that's... That's a tribute to the Boston area comedy scene, you know? You know, during the hot days when there was good clubs, as long as there's a good club, you get good comics. It happens. There's plenty. Oh, you know it was a really good comic that I worked with? Is Bob Marley. Oh, yeah, he's, he's packing theaters now, Bob, sure. Bob Marley packs them in. Bob oh. Marley's like Elvis up in Maine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember Bob Marley being a new young guy. His father used to work for the Comic Connection in Portland. Another nice, really nice man. I tried to book Bob. I called his people. They told me he don't do any place lower than 300 seats. I was like, well, it must be nice. <laughs> but he's pulling them. They're coming, you know, yeah. He's, 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 one of the, he's one of the special prolific acts. He has like 10 albums or some nonsense. There's 10 CDs or DVDs. I mean, he just comes up with new material constantly. Going on and on. He's got a huge following. So mm -hmm. they're giving you that figure because he can command it. Now, I don't know how the pandemic's affected him, but, I mean, he, he'd do New Year's Eve shows in Portland and do, like, five of them or something. That's <laughs> a lot of material right there, yeah. <laughs> well, but he is one of the nicest guys. Yeah, that always it's always good when you're working with the nice guys in comedy than than you do when you hit a jerk. And I mean, I've, you, you try to be nice, but unfortunately everybody's not that way. So it gets to be you can't be nice to everybody because you're not getting it in return, you know. No, not everybody is nice. Yeah. That's for sure. It's, it's a really cutthroat a, business, and I have a story. Once I remember, once I was working in Jersey, and I was the middle act, the big comic club rascals, I think. I won't say the comic's name, but he's a fairly he's a successful guy. And he's a headliner. And I didn't see him for the first show, you know. He was on after me. And I did really good the first show, you know. So I'm feeling pretty good, you know. I'm sitting in the green room, and I don't talk to him, you know. And then the second show comes, and he's from Jersey, so he's got all kinds of his friends there and everything. It's a packed crowd for the second show. And they were tough. They were really tough. And... I kind of barely get through because a lot of noise and some of the noisiest people were his friends. <laughs> oh boy. So I don't stay around to see his show, right? Mm -hmm. I leave. I go where I'm staying at the time. You know, I come back the next night. I'm in the green room before the show. Now we hadn't really talked to each other, you know. He came in after me for the first show and I didn't see him before. The... He walks up to me and says, uh, so what do you think of that second show? <laughs> now, it was tough. I thought it was hard. They were noisy, you know, I struggled to get through it. So I said, I thought they were kind of tough. He looks at me and goes, oh, turns around, no answer, and walks away. Now, usually when someone says, what do you think of the second show, and you knew he saw me have a hard time, 
you would say, yeah, they were kind of rough. I saw you up there. You know, you would commiserate. He says nothing to me, and he walks away. <laughs> and I said, that's kind of weird. So I went up to some of the people who were working there. I says, how did he do the second show? Oh, he killed. Oh. So let me get this straight. He had a great show, yet he wanted to come up to me to have me say out loud that I suck. I mean, he's just an asshole. Yeah, some people are like that. They try to make themselves feel big, you know, by putting other people down. I mean, not right? good yeah. enough that he saw me struggle and he killed. Yeah. He just he wanted, wanted to rub it in your face, rub it I in guess. My face right? a yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, have you ever considered quitting comedy? Have you ever had a night like that and said, you know what, I'm going to just survive those nights and do it for the good ones? I, I didn't catch that, Dennis. What's the question? Have, have you ever thought of quitting comedy? You ever took a break from comedy? or? You know, I've never really thought of quitting. No? I, I've thought I've been really down and disappointed. Yeah. But I've never really thought of quitting because... Kind of, I mean, you know, when you do it for so long, it's part of your identity. It's part of who I am. Right. You know, if I don't do a show, that doesn't mean I'm not a comedian. I'm a yeah. comedian until they put me in the grave. <laughs> yeah, you, you survive the bad nights and you do it for the good nights, right? You know, you get down, you get depressed, and you get down on yourself. Huh. But I never reached the point where I said, that's it, I'm not going on stage anymore. You know, part of it is I have a really good family that doesn't need me to be funny to love me. Right. Support, right. Support. So when I go home, I know I'm okay without the show being terrific. So maybe that gives me enough strength to keep going. So in 40 years, what, what's what's the worst heckle you ever heard? You ever get a really, you ever had a real drunk go at you? Or what's the worst one you ever had? You know, I've had many hecklers many drunks and many obnoxious crowds. I mean, I've had I got three or four times I had a person stand on a table and moon me. Really? And sit back down. <laughs> so Go drink pretty, another one. Pretty much isn't anything I haven't had negative happen in right, the course right, of right. my 40 years. But the worst shows are not sometimes what people think. They think it's the heckler and the rowdy. If, if the whole crowd isn't doing it, if there's only one person Sometimes, you, if you're funny enough, you can get to people. I'm not a big put-down person. I don't look to put people down. But you usually can get the crowd on your side if it's just a couple of people. Right. The hard crowds are the ones where it's not a couple of people. It's a lot of people. Either they're real loud so no one can hear what you're doing and you can't focus on one, or they're dead. And, and I think the hardest thing is when they're dead. I used to say the worst feeling in comedy is you go up, you got, you, you're got to do your act, and you do the first five minutes and you get nothing. Right. And you're panicking inside. And you go through your roll deck to your act, what you got, and you figure, I'll give them this, this will get them. And you get nothing. <laughs> and you look down your watch, you got another 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know you're going to do that 40 minutes because you need the money. I hit a crowd like that at Dangerfield's Comedy Club of all places. How do you hit a dead crowd at Dangerfield's Comedy Club? Like, are you kidding me? But all night, not oh, one comic could get a laugh. Anywhere, it was. And that's the worst feeling. They're just dead and there's nothing you can do. Yeah, and I knew it wasn't me. There wasn't I a single comic. I say at the end of the show, they don't hate you. They pity you. Yeah. It's a tough one. You can't tell them. You know, really, that joke you didn't laugh at? The last 90 people crowds in a row laughed at that joke. <laughs> yeah, well, as long as you get paid, that's half the battle sometimes. Well, I'll give my pay and I'll move on to the next one, right, you know? Yeah, I think Dennis Leary used to have a line, you know, well, you've been $200. Next one. Yeah, next one, next one. <laughs> Well, but I got another guy coming on Funny Like a Clown podcast that you've worked with. So uh, before he comes on the show, do you got a good story about him? His name's Chance Langdon. Well, I got a lot of stories about Chance <laughs> Langdon. Well, give me one and I'll ask him about it when he comes on the podcast. Well, let me think of a good Chance Langdon story. Give peace. Give Chance a peace. Give Chance. That's one of his famous lines. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Chance, I, I don't want to say anything to put him down because Chance was not only a great comic, Chance was a great 
booker and hustler. He's a good person, yeah. Chance would get jobs. He would get jobs. I always used to say, anytime I did a job with Chance, he was always making more money than me. <laughs> always. Yeah, he was. He was one of the legends of Boston. He was. He was a heck of an actor in the day. Yeah. Well, and plus he was a great hustler. I mean, he would come come up with acts. He would come up with shows. I mean, he always had shows. And he has a. He was a singer when he first started. He was a singer and a comic. So he used to do afternoon straight singing gigs back in the old days. Right. Even in, yeah, he's and a guitar actually. He's a great, action, great yeah. guitar player. Chance is a great guitar player. Right. You can't get to open with Rodney Dangerfield once. That must have been Rodney Dangerfield. You, you know, know, Rodney yeah. Dangerfield for quite a long time. Oh, yeah. was it a long time, man? Yeah. Oh. Any crazy backstage stories we should know about? Crazy stories about Chance. I don't want to put Chance down. <laughs> <laughs> well, just in a funny way. You don't have to put him down. I mean, Chance was always such a positive thinker. Chance would never say no for an answer. Yeah. That's what it I takes in this remember. business. He was out in L.A., and this friend of mine, Tom Gilmore, was living with him in an apartment, and Chance was expecting a call from an agent for uh, a sitcom. Yeah. And he told Tom, you know, let me know if so-and-so calls. And uh, so Gilmore says, okay, I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let you know if he calls. So Chance goes out, the guy calls, and the guy tells Tom, look, if Chance is calling, I'll let him know if I get something. Tell him to stop calling me. He's always calling me. Tell him to stop calling me. So Chance walks in. He says, did the guy call? And Gilmore goes, yeah, but he said don't call him. Chance <laughs> goes, really? I think I'll give him a call. I'll give him a call. There we go. That's he calls a... him up. Gilmore says the guy is screaming at him. Chance is holding <laughs> the phone away from his ear. The guy is so pissed off. <laughs> That's, but you that know... was Chance. Well, sometimes you can be over-aggressive. Yeah, I've been over-aggressive before, and then they stop talking to me. Well, if you're not aggressive, you don't get nothing, so there's a fine line. Chance had no fear. He yeah. had no fear to go try and sell his shows. Yeah. Well, Back lot, in the old days. You know, I, I book a lot of big shows, and people tell me, how do you do it? I say, I outwork everybody, you know? It's not that I'm funnier than anybody else. I, I put in the work. That's what it takes, you know? You gotta outwork everybody else trying to do it. That's right, and that's what Chance did. You can compare notes because Chance, and he doesn't do it now probably, but he did it in the old days. There was no one better hustling than Chance. No. You gotta be a hustler. All right, Bill, we're approaching an hour, so I'll give you a final question here. I think it's important. Uh, being on the comedy scene 40 years, I mean, there's a lot of young kids on the scene. They want to follow the path that you've already already gone down. If you had some advice for the young comics coming up, what would your advice to them be? Well, my advice would be, you think you're funny believe in yourself don't have everybody else tell you what you should do what you think you got to do to be famous you, you have to find your own way your own voice and just believe in yourself and follow all the positive reinforcement you can get to get confidence because you need confidence to do it and I think a lot of people want to get somewhere a little too fast it takes time but if you're funny and you really believe you're funny You'll, you'll get positive reinforced. You'll get it. And I think you have to follow the positive. And don't listen to the people that tell you, you got to do this, you got to do There is no one way. You find your own way. Mm -hmm. But you have to be persistent. And just keep going until you feel this is how I do it. This is the best way I can do it. And do it your own way. Don't listen to other people. Find your own way. Good advice. <laughs> if I listen to other comics, I'd have quit years ago. But I didn't. So. <laughs> And I'm, I was going strong before the COVID. Well, thank you for being on Funny Like Clown Podcast, Bill. I hope you had a good time. It was fun, Dennis. Always good to talk comedy, especially yeah. nowadays. <laughs> well, hopefully the pandemic gets over sooner and I can see you on the comedy scene sometime, okay? Take care. All right, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Bye-bye. All right, Bill Campbell, one of the veterans of the Boston comedy scene right there on Funny Like Clown Podcast, going back to the Ding Ho comedy days, and that's, uh, for Boston, that's the, the mecca of where comedy started at Ding Ho Restaurant, and uh, the reason that all the comics in Boston today have a stage to perform on is because of guys like these who, who made comedy into a thing in Boston before it was a thing, and uh, before that, like you said, you'll be lucky to get five minutes opening for a singer somewhere where... 
comedy then became a mainstream thing and uh, became so mainstream in Boston, The Tonight Show came calling and uh, it's taken off from there. COVID's giving it a beat down right at the moment. You can't do much, but uh, like every great thing in the world, it will be back because you, you can't keep a good thing down, okay? Because, uh, you know, comedy's too big to end. It's not going to end. It's just a matter of when it'll be back, not if it'll be back. This is Fiacom Podcast. We will be back next week uh, doing some interviews. Hope I'm getting more on from the Ding Ho restaurants and we can uh, explore the history of Boston comedy. Doing it together. Me and you, Dennis Worth, Final Comp Podcast. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tune us in and uh, we're exploring the history of comedy. Know your history or you're doomed to repeat it. Tune in here, learn about it and laugh. See you next week, folks. Good night.